Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Greetings and peace. My name is Baraka Blue, and you are tuned in to Path and Present Podcast. This episode is with Dr. Abdullah Rothman. This is a follow up to the podcast that we did just a couple months ago on Islamic psychology. I'm going to introduce the podcast momentarily, but before I do, I wanted to uh, make a few quick announcements. Alhamdulillah. The first is that uh, many of you know I've been teaching writing workshops with Rumi Center for Spirituality and the Arts, and we have an upcoming uh, online writing workshop in August, beginning August 15th. Opening the Eye of the Heart is a 30-day course in writing as spiritual practice. In addition to daily writings, this workshop will include daily readings of poems from great visionary and mystical poets of the East and West, as well as weekly lessons, exercises, and live sessions. Last but not least, it will include a forum for participants to share their writings and reflections with an intimate group of fellow writers. So you can find more about this and you can register at RumiCenterWorkshops.com, uh, RumiCenterWorkshops.com. This is uh, Rumi Center is uh, a space that we've been running these workshops now online for over a year uh, after having been doing writing workshops in person for many, many years. And it's been going great online. We have kind of each quarter we do uh, at least one course and um, we have a global cohort every time people from Malaysia, people from Europe, people from the Middle East, people from uh, the Far East, um, all over North America. It's been really wonderful, alhamdulillah, to have people from so many backgrounds. We even had someone from Japan uh, last time, and um, we've had people from Africa as well, North Africa in particular. So it's been a beautiful blessing. And we have people come together in a, a, you know, kind of sacred setting, a community of seekers and creatives, exploring, looking at the great writers of the past, the great mystical poets, and particularly the Sufi poets, but looking at other uh, poets from the Zen tradition, as well as mystical poets of Europe, of the English language, in particular, like William Blake, as well as Emily Dickinson, uh, Walt Whitman, etc. And so we're really exploring not just writing, but what it means to be human, what it means to perceive. And I really focus on the, the fact that um, being a poet is primarily a way of seeing and only secondarily about writing. So we're really focusing on seeing the world through new eyes. And so this is really for anyone who uh, would like to see deeper would like to see and perceive in new ways. And you don't have to have any writing experience. We have people that uh, have never written before. We have people that have written and enjoy writing, but have never written poetry before. We have people that are published uh, authors already, you know, the whole spectrum. But it, it's really a, a space that we cultivate of, you know, love and nurturing community togetherness. And it's really about um, learning from the great masters of the past, studying the great symbolism of the Sufi poets, and then uh, trying to deepen our own practice. Writing is a kind of contemplative or meditative practice uh, when approached from the right angle. And I always say that for those that really devote themselves to the creative, to a creative path, a path of art, um, they realize very quick that it's much more about self-discovery than self-expression. It's only secondarily about expressing oneself, but it's primarily about exploring and understanding oneself in ways that uh, would be unimaginable if one doesn't take that dive into the self. And, you know, that kind of mantra that we, that we read in Rumi's poetry, you think yourself just a drop in the ocean, but you are also the entire ocean in a drop and exploring what that might even mean is really what we're doing with these courses. So, alhamdulillah, uh, registration is currently open for the course beginning uh, August 15th. It's online. 
and most of it can be done at your own pace and in your own uh, free time. Uh, there is a live component every week, but most of it is uh, so is work that you can do at your own time. But then there's a, a forum that we have a closed Facebook group where everyone is able to interact, upload, read each other's poems, comment on each other's poems. And that's really the highlight of it for me is to, to see the community develop. And we also have it an ongoing kind of alumni group after the course for anyone who's interested. So, yeah, I hope you check it out. Um, and then secondly, uh, I want to thank all our patrons, all of our supporters on Patreon. This podcast is something that um, we love to do. It's a service. It's, it's a beautiful to see these co- conversations happening in a world in which, you know, so many conversations are superficial. Even on the news, they try to discuss deep, you know, very complex issues. And they say, OK, you have 10 seconds go, you know, and, and here with this kind of long form conversation, we have our guests for at least an hour and we can actually get into conversations with really interesting people, whether they're authors, spiritual teachers, psychologists, um, you know, academics, um, musicians, uh, whatever it may be, permaculturists, whatever it may be. So I want to thank our patrons because you're what make this possible. There's a lot of time and effort that goes into this. And because we desire to do it consistently and we have been doing it more consistently, um, it takes a lot of time and energy. So uh, everybody make a quick prayer and express your gratitude from your heart to everyone who's supporting on Patreon. So this goes out to you. You know who you are. I won't list all your names, but you know who you are. And this is all uh, courtesy of you. And if you are someone who enjoys these conversations uh, and you have the ability, please do support on Patreon. Uh, Patreon is basically a way where you can support month to month with as little as a dollar a month. And something like $5 a month or $10 a month each, if every listener who really enjoys these and partakes in these uh, every month were to support with something like 5 or $10 a month, it would be very easy for us to be able to do these more consistently and, and in, in, in fact, even fly guests out and devote the time necessary and get the equipment necessary to make this um, a beautiful thing. And uh, especially we want to do more vis- video podcasts as well and not just audio. But again, these things take time, energy, and money. So if you can support, if you deem this a worthy effort, then please do. And you can find our um, page on patreon.com slash path and present. All right. So after those couple announcements, I want to introduce our guest, um, Dr. Abdullah Rothman is a psychologist. He um, is currently working at the American uh, University of, uh, actually, New York University, Abu Dhabi, NYU Abu Dhabi. Uh, And he brought me out there recently, and we did a series of programs. And I was able to meet him and speak with him at a couple conferences and things of that nature that we've had the pleasure of sharing space at. And... um, Really, our um, interests overlap a lot, really, uh, on conversations of psychology, spiritual growth, understanding the self, um, you know, the world's mystical traditions, um, the way that we can revive and rearticulate the profound wisdom of the ancients within our tradition to modern contemporary audience. Uh, no matter what their uh, faith commitments may be. And so, alhamdulillah, uh, we've always had really great conversations. So as you remember, we had him as a guest uh, a few months ago. And that conversation has uh, was really loved. We got a lot of really positive feedback, and people really loved that. Um, when I shared it, I also shared a diagram that Dr. Abdullah made, which is of the soul. It's like psychology according to the Islamic tradition. So the ruh, the nafs, the aql, right? The the spirit, the self, the intellect, 
the ego, all these things. And he's done a lot of research on this kind of model of the soul in Islamic psychology from this great 1400 uh, year old wisdom tradition. And so basically, when I shared the diagram, people loved it and reshared it and asked a bunch of questions about it. And it generated a lot of interest and discussion. So I realized that even though we kind of generally touched on these topics in our first podcast, that it would be really worthwhile to do a follow up podcast in which we just focused on the model, just focused on the diagram and commented on it and explained it and explored it. So um, we also recorded a video of this. And so you'll be able to see that if you are a Patreon supporter. So the, the video of some of these podcasts will be made available exclusively to our Patreon supporters. Um, so you can check that out. And that might be helpful, especially because we're going through a diagram here. But no matter who you are, uh, on our SoundCloud and on our social media, we have linked to the diagram so that you can look at it. And I would recommend taking a look. Um, you know, ideally while you're listening to this or before you're listening to this, but even after will be helpful because we reference a lot of these terms and we do our best to explain them, uh, keeping in mind that most people are going to be listening to this and not watching this or looking at the diagram as they listen. But we also, um, we also kind of keep in mind that we are commenting on a visual diagram. And so to be able to look at that will be really helpful as you listen to this. Um, so yeah, that's what it is. And I pray there's great blessing in it. Um, please don't forget to rate, like, comment on iTunes, on SoundCloud, or wherever you're listening to this, and to share it with your people, anyone who you think might be interested. All right, y'all. Love and light. So yeah, man, um, the recent podcast we did on Sufi psychology toward an Islamic framework of the soul, which I basically used the, the, the subtitle is from your paper. Um, it got a lot of positive feedback so far. People love it from all over. And, um, but not only that, but when I shared it, I shared the physical diagram that you did of the kind of uh, psychology from an Islamic perspective with the ruh, the qalb, the nafs, the aql, all these, the, the spirit, the heart, and all these various terms. And you, mashallah, made a really beautiful diagram. So that generated a lot of discussion and people asking questions and people conversing and debating and sharing. And so it made me realize that in the first conversation, we spoke kind of generally and just, you know, heart to heart um, conversation, but we didn't, uh, it made me realize that if we had another follow-up conversation where we focus more on that model, uh, it could be really fruitful because there was a lot of questions that people had and a lot of discussion around it. So, I mean, uh, alhamdulillah, that's why we're here. And I'm honored to be in conversation with you. Of course, last time we were both in a hotel room in Los Angeles, and today we're doing it through the magic of Zoom. Uh, I'm in Seattle and you're in Abu Dhabi. So, uh, inshallah, we can use these tools of technology to continue the conversation. Um, so, yeah, man, I mean, I think the, w the place to start is why don't you just introduce, you know, kind of how you got into this and, and what inspired you to make this model? Yeah. Uh, Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. It's good to be back in the space with you. 
I'm an avid listener to all your podcasts, so it's cool mm -hmm. to be in the mix in the conversation. Um, basically, I had been a practicing psychotherapist doing counseling primarily with the Muslim community for like, at that point that I started this project, it was about, had been about 10 years of me doing just work with the Muslim community. And I had always been studying uh, from the beginning of my career with Professor Malik Badri and other scholars and, and Shayukh on understanding Islamic model of psychology and then how to apply that. And then I guess I, I came to a point of realization that there's just a, a lot of people out there that could potentially be doing this work that want to be doing this work that just there's some missing links in terms of like how to understand this and put it into application. And there have been a lot of efforts in Islamic psychology sort of theorizing, but most of it was coming from psychologists, you know, people who like me, whose primary focus is on psychology, understanding uh, people in the context of, of therapy, and then trying to understand this Islamic model from that lens, which is important because I think a psychologist has to be the one to understand how it relates to something like helping people with it in psychotherapy. But what happened is a lot of times people's sort of own interpretations of these things or, you know, it's not, it wasn't necessarily really rooted and grounded in the, the theology and sort of like the knowledge from the ulama. And so my research, I went back and did a PhD after, you know, I had already had a master's in psychology, but went back and tried to figure out like, how can I devise this so that we're really getting to like a, a structure of understanding, like what is the, what is the sort of theory of Islamic psychology? Mm. Because, you know, it is a thing. I mean, it exists in the Islamic tradition, but it doesn't exist as psychology per se in this separate, uh, you know, discipline that we understand in the West of psychology. It's, it was spread out among all these different branches of knowledge within the Islamic sciences, you know, uh, falsafa, kalam, uh, you know, tasawwuf, all of these different places. And so really, what I felt like needed to happen was to disseminate all of that and put it into the um, into a framework that would be understandable from you know something like a psychological understanding. Mm. So so essentially, what I did was I, I interviewed eighteen scholars. This is the first part of the research uh, was to interview eighteen scholars of different fields of. Um, knowledge within the Islamic tradition. So I, I, eight, I interviewed 18 scholars. They came from like five basic different um, backgrounds. It's people who were academics in Islamic philosophy, people who were religious scholars, like from, a, from the Islamic tradition, religiously studying this, the, uh, the law and tradition and all, all these different elements. Then there was a category of people who were academic scholars of uh, Tasawwuf and then Shayukh who are like practitioners of Tasawwuf mm. and then uh, people who who were studying sort of an academic uh, approach to Islamic uh, Islamic knowledge and and so it was through those interviews that I pulled all of this um, you know, it was me as a psychologist sort of knowing what to ask in terms of like how, what is important for understanding, you know, the, the, the inner workings of the human being and not having it be this really broad um, philosophical um, thing where we're trying to talk about the, the, the broadest, deepest realities of the human being because that can get really, really deep and you can get really lost in it and then it's hard to bring it back down to earth of like, well, how does this relate to just, mm -hmm. you know, us struggling through life? Mm -hmm. So that was the, that was the approach. And then I, um, from all that data that I had from asking all these, you know, asking these scholars, what is the most important fundamental aspects to understand psychology? Then from my experience from a, a practicing psychologist, I was able to 
determine what is the most important in terms of understanding how this can actually make sense to people in terms of growth and development, right? So, you know, this model that, that, that I created could have looked lots of different ways. You know, there's, a, there's people who, can, who could conceptualize it differently and there could be a lot of different things included, but essentially what this was is what are the, what are the most fundamental elements that are important to understand for uh, movement and trajectory in terms of development? Mashallah. Yeah, I mean, um, yeah, and I love it. And I mean, like we discussed in the previous um, conversation, there's a really profound tradition. And there's an idea, in fact, that the human potential is immense in, in the sense that we have a, an ability to awaken a higher self within us, which is at the core of each of our beings. And, uh, but we're not, we're not there. We're not necessarily there. Most people don't attain it. And really, this is at the essence of all religious traditions. It's not just Islam, right? I mean, all religious traditions have teachings of, right, the fall or the forgetfulness or the the lost heart or the initial state of oneness and unity and awareness and bliss that has been somehow lost and that the the purpose of life is to attain that state once more and that in a in essence this is what the uh core calling or core teaching of religion is, is to how to orient ourselves such that we can um, make the journey back to that state. And so that's why I think your, your model is really beautiful because this is at the center of the Islamic tradition, but yet if you really um, discuss it, many Muslims themselves, let alone other people outside of the Islamic faith, are not really aware of this and I mean there's literally nothing that's more tragic than not being aware of this because you know like Sayyidina Ali said Man arafa nasuhu faqad arafa rabbuhu. whoever knows himself knows his Lord and so this is actually the great key to understanding the whole affair of existence and um, so for me personally uh, I, I, I really love this work and I love that you looked at scholars from different disciplines or different perspectives and took in their insights and their perspectives uh, when making this. So um, I don't know if you want to introduce this model a bit more before we jump into it or if you just want to jump into it. Yeah, um, I'll jump into it by, by sort of responding to what you're saying in that, you know, that is the, the thing is, is that religion for sure is about understanding that primordial uh, reality of the human being and relationship to God, right? Mm -hmm. But then ironically, even within these religious traditions, we get sort of cut off or from that, that experiential um, experience or connection mm -hmm. of, really, of really witnessing God mm -hmm. and really understanding that as a, as a dynamic in our daily lives. And it's, um, but the, it's ironic, but at the same time, it should be expected because like we said, the, 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 the word insan for man is our nature is to be forgetful. You know, the root of the same word for human being is forgetfulness. And so it is sort of par for the course that we were veiled. And so we're always going to cycle back around to like forgetting this, this reality. Mm -hmm. and, and, the, and imagine that's within the context of, of a spiritual tradition which is oriented to it, and you still we forget, right? So imagine then secular world, we're talking about psychology, the whole premise is, doesn't even include God necessarily. You know, I think oftentimes, and now more, more so modern psychology is making room for that, but it's really gonna be based on the client and or the therapist to bring that in on their own, because already we're understanding psychology as like a science, that is not that does not necessarily involve pre-existence or the afterlife or God. Mm -hmm. You know, it's sort of trying to understand the inner workings of the human being in isolation, 
which from an Islamic perspective just doesn't even make sense. You wouldn't, you, you, that would just be naive to try to understand how the human being is working without, without understanding how God is a part of that or how the barzakh is a part of that or how the akhirah is a part of that. You know, it's all integral. Mm-hmm. So when I, you know, sort of thinking about or looking at this model, this visual representation of the Islamic model of the soul, the very first thing, the very fundamental thing, as far as I'm concerned, was Allah. Subhanahu wa ta'ala. And just God, before you jump into this, I want to let people know that are just listening to this, that uh, we will link to the this model on... Um, on all of our platforms and our social media as well. So you can check it out uh, and as well as our SoundCloud. Um, So you can look at the model. It's really worth taking a look at. But for those that are just uh, listening, we'll do our best also to explain the model, inshallah, as well. Yeah. So I'll try to speak in visual uh, imagery. Mm -hmm. Uh, But so... The, the, very, the very first thing and fundamental thing, as far as I was concerned, was to include God in the picture. Hmm. You know, not trying to understand the human being in isolation, which we often do. Um, and so then, you know, at the, visually at the top of this model is this circle with the word Allah in it. Hmm. And then um, there is a, an arrow coming down like going into this this circle in the middle, which represents the human being. Mm. And so automatically, the very first thing is understanding that there is this like direct connection from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to the human being. Mm -hmm. And this is a fundamental difference in an Islamic model than even many other religious Mm. uh, models is that we, in Islam, there is a, it, it posits that we actually have access and not only an access point to Allah in our living daily lives so Allah so God didn't just create his creation and then step away mm-hmm. you know there is an actual um, uh, spark of his uh, reality and his light in each and every one of us and that that's not just also just there disconnected but that there is an actual um, entry point I would say or even access point which is the ruh, mm-hmm. right? So the, the ruh was breathed in. So, so even in the model, you can look at it. So there, there was God and then this, this spirit, this ruh was breathed into the human being. And so this is the very first time that the, the human being in its form takes, takes shape in this life. And then, but so what we're saying is it doesn't even start there. Like, so the whole psychological experience of the human being actually starts even before that moment of creation because uh, there was this point where all of the souls in the barzakh before uh, creation witnessed Allah. Mm-hmm. So Allah said, Allah said, am I not your Lord? And every single soul, Muslim or non-Muslim, said, Bella uh, shahidna. Mm-hmm. And so that point of, of there being an actual uh, recognition and witnessing and even like... Um, reality to the existence of these souls, that's going to come in from day one as a reality of how this person, this individual human being is interacting with the world. Because mm-hmm. it's based on that there's this deeper, pure aspect of the soul that, that exists in the human being. And then when we come into this world, we're veiled from that. <clears throat> you know, in San, we forget. Mm-hmm. And so that sort of positions us in this trajectory of how what, what we now understand today as our, our psychology, you know, this, this sort of how we react and respond to our life. Um, are you going to say something? No, I love it, man. I mean, so yeah, we, there is the divine reality, the ultimate reality. And then there is the ruh of each one of us, that we each have a spirit that, like you said, was in the divine presence in that plane of alastu birabikum, and is essentially from that. I mean, uh, you know, 
Nafas Rahman, the breath of the All Merciful, right? The, the Spirit was breathed into Adam in the Quran. So that the, in, in some way, some sense that the, our very Spirit has, it, has it's been ascribed by Allah in the Quran to Himself, right? It's like a breath of His, that each one of us is like an exhalation of the, of the ultimate reality, which yeah. is a profound reality. But then, like you said, the Nasya, the Insan is forgetful of that true nature so we have that as our true nature that's like the foundational starting point is that our true nature is spirit and is you know oriented towards the divine presence and is you know spent you know time out of time in a sense an eternity witnessing and contemplating the divine presence in that plane and that when we find ourselves in this realm as human beings in this uh, dunya, which you're going to get into, um, we are often uh, forgetful of that true nature. Is that correct? Yeah, that's right. And and then, you know, ironically, we won't get into this, but just to, to sort of foreshadow to the whole point in all this for me is how do you get back to, exactly. to that remembering and, and, you know, how to, how to, how do you access that, original experience and ironically you know we're talking about the breath being breathed into us the ruh being breathed into us and really like when i'm working with people the the very first thing that i'm helping people orient to, to be able to access and to be in this place of of um hudur or shahud or witnessing is breathing mm. right because by breathing you're like tapping into this moment of in this moment of presence, which is where you can access this witnessing. And what happens is we live in this temporary, and this is the thing that people often forget, is that this world is temporary. This isn't the end all. And so our whole experience as a human being is predicated on this temporary reality. You know, and so the whole experience that we're having now when we even following this model down to where this in the middle of this circle has these different elements, these other elements other than the ruh only exist in this plane of dunya. Mm -hmm. So all of what we're now talking about in terms of like psychology of the human being is the psychology of the human being in the dunya. Right. right? And so that, that ruh now is in us, but at the same time, we are in this perceived separation. Mm -hmm. And so this creates this dynamic and it's somewhat of a paradox because ultimately the reality is still that we are from Allah and there is unity, mm -hmm. the Tawheed, and we have the ability to witness and come back to that Tawheed. But we're the veil, part of that veil has, that has covered us includes some other elements in our in sort of the makeup of our soul and so then in that circle i put the ruh at the top of the circle so it's like circ four circles within that circle mm -hmm. so at the top of the circle is the, the ruh because it's closer to the to the to the you know on this in this model it's sort of like up and down as a visual representation of um sort of where we're we can come back to being the upward so the, the higher element and then this downward um, aspect that's oriented towards the dunya. And so in the top sphere of this circle is the ruh. And so that is where we can access or, or um, Allah and that where that was breathed in. But then on the, let's jump to the, the bottom of that circle is the nafs. Mm -hmm. And so when we, in our experience as a human being we have this nafs right and so the word nafs can be translated simply as soul meaning the whole our whole soul our whole integral being mm -hmm. <clears throat> however the, how it's often termed and talked about amongst the scholars is you'll hear this word nafs referred to as like the base part of the human being that is sort of pulling them down towards their um their forgetfulness in the dunya, right? Mm -hmm. And sort of orienting towards evil inclinations or even just not necessarily evil, but even just evil predicated on staying with the separation, forgetting Allah, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And even in the Quran, the word nafs 
whenever the word nafs is referred to, it's referred in like a negative, like it, it's something that has to be held accountable on the day of judgment. Whereas the ruh is always referred to in the positive. And even the Quran is, is referenced by the word ruh. So it's this aspect of the human being that is pure. Whereas the nafs is this aspect of the human being that is veiled, you know, and so the sort of the problems that get accumulated from being disconnected. Mm -hmm. And then, so, so what, what that positions is two sort of um, polar, you know, two sort of opposite pulls towards mm -hmm. purity and towards, um, you could say, impurity, mm -hmm. right? And that, so then there becomes, so Ghazali talks about like the, Ghazali talks about the inside the human being that being this battleground. And it's this battleground between the pull towards the dunya of forgetfulness and this pull of towards remembering our true nature, our fitra. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and that, you know, sort of that spark that we have inside of us of that pure light in the ruh. And so in the middle of those two poles is the qalb and the aql, let's say. So the reason why I put, so in the middle of these two, I put qalb and aql next to each other in purple to represent, so the, the, the upper part is blue, the lower part is red to represent these different poles. But then the middle is purple because blue and red is purple, right? Mm -hmm. And in this sort of middle ground, is where that battle happens, where the struggle happens, the jihad, jihad and nafs. And what you have there is the qalb, which is the center of the human being from an Islamic perspective. Um, and Which is the heart, in, 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 literally the word heart. for heart. Yeah, the word for, for heart. And it's different than, you know, so, so there is a connection between the physical heart and the spiritual heart, but really what we're talking about in terms of the soul, we're talking about the spiritual heart. Mm -hmm. um, and what, what in the Quran it says, uh, there is a, uh, it talks a lot about the qalb, it talks a lot about referencing the heart as something that perceives, right? Um, do they not have hearts with which they Yakiluna, which with which with with which they perceive or with which with which they intellect, this idea of there being consciousness in the heart. Mm -hmm. And so what I put the word akal, meaning like this cogn cognition aspect of the of the psyche, in parallel with the kal, because really the akal uh, is not necessarily a thing in and of itself, it is a function of the kal. Mm -hmm which is where we really get a divergence from modern Western secular psychology, which, you know, um, understands consciousness and cognition as being a function of the brain primarily or, or really even uh, only. Um, and so really when we're talking about the central consciousness of the human being in an Islamic paradigm, this is in the heart. And so there's this, intelligence that exists in the heart and what that can do is choose this is where sort of our our free will comes into play is where we can turn towards the ruh or turn towards the nafs and this becomes this uh the the crux of this whole battle ground and so the word kalb meaning heart also the root of the word takalab which means to turn so the heart is a turner. Mm -hmm. It can turn one way or the other. So on this model, I have represented these arrows, these sort of curved arrows on, on both the top and bottom to, to uh, illustrate that the kalb can turn towards the ruh or it can turn towards the nafs. And the akal is a part of that uh, mechanism. So the akal, this, this sort of... Uh, Yaki Luna function, this perception or this cognition uh, is becomes like, you know, the word akal also means like a shackle. So it becomes the shackle to, to keep the heart in line and to make choices. So this is where our choice comes in to choose towards our higher self or choose to just go with our um, sort of lower inclinations that are 
uh, we'll talk about it in a little bit that are that are influenced and clouded by our experience in the dunya. So I like this a lot. So you kind of have, you literally have three colors, and so you kind of have like three levels or three realms, right? That we're kind of getting into here. So you have, uh, I mean, above them all, you have Allah. You have the divine reality, but then. In blue, you have the ruh, which is this high spiritual nature. And then in red, you have the nafs, like the lower egoic, selfish, forgetful nature that's trapped in duality and separation, you could say. Right. And then in between, the qalb and the aql in purple, which is this, this, this um, cognition the essence of the, the the kind of like core of the human being, which can either turn towards the ruh, the, the spiritual realm, or turn towards the realm of forgetfulness and separation and darkness, etc. And the, you also make this point that the qalb and the aql are related, i.e. the heart and the intellect are related, even though I think, you know, this is important because when we think of the intellect, uh, I think if you go back to Latin intellectus, it has a more, it has a meaning that will fit with ours. But we tend to think of, I think modern people tend to think of the heart and the intellect almost like at odds, right? right. Because it's like, follow your heart, that's what I feel. But then my intellect okay. is follow, yeah, follow your heart, right? Right, whereas, you know, there's really important conversations about this within our tradition that the, the, the intellect is truly, you could say, that faculty of wisdom. It's not mm. about what's your intelligence quotient, right? What's your IQ, right? How much data can you recall? And you know what I mean? It has nothing to do with that. But it's really a function of the spiritual heart, i.e., can you... Um, do you choose virtue? Do you choose light? Do you choose the righteous path? Because, and even there's, you know, conversation that someone's intellect is deformed if they are, if it is not characterized by specific virtues, because in a sense, the virtues are those things which allow us to ascend, right? You know, selflessness, courage, generosity, kindness, etc. Whereas, you know, being selfish, being, jealous being uh um overly lustful or gluttonous they, they actually veil us from being able to see things as they truly are right so this right. is a, the essence of that relationship i think between the intellect and the heart it just because modern people think of these as dichotomous is important to kind of explain that for, from this perspective the true wise person Aqil, the one with an intellect, is one who is either virtuous or working on itself to acquire virtue so that it can purify the mirror of the heart to see things as they truly are. Exactly. And the, and the heart is that, that aspect of the human being, the core, that can perceive things as they are because it is um, in its natural state, it is, um, it is connected to Allah. Right, and so it can perceive how Allah has made things. Right, but I think in the in the in sort of modern times, secular West, however you want to think about it, there's this like this dichotomy that you talk about. People think that following your heart is this whimsical thing that's going to take you down this, um, you know, potentially dangerous path. And and there there is an element to that's a reality to that because without Without the akal, without the um, sort of using our wisdom and using that part of that is an innate intuitive wisdom, but then part of that is like following guidance, mm. right? And this is why we have the Quran and we have the Prophet وسلم, to show us what is the better way and then to understand that with our intellect, with our intelligence, and then to apply that to rein in our tendency. However, our tendency towards going off, you know, off of off center is not necessarily a function of the heart. It's a function of the heart being disconnected. 
mm-hmm. which is really a more of a function of the nafs. Mm-hmm. The nafs has has sort of um, been been fed by you know doing what we want and staying stuck in this individual individuation where we're not seeing the the unity and that has influenced the heart to sort of swerve or sway towards different pathways which we have now perceived as the heart being sort of whimsical but really the heart in its clean purified form would would actually lead you to the right place so the the work really is about cleaning the heart so that so that the heart actually does is something you want to follow so you know people are have half of it right in being cautious about following the heart is just because their heart may not be in the right state right the heart is actually kind of co-opted or turned exclusively towards the nafs towards the lower aspects of oneself as opposed to turn up to the spirit right Mm-hmm. And then, so this up and down, so on this model, I uh, made it so that, you know, up, so towards the blue half is really not only where we're striving to go, so like going back to our fitra, so at the top, you can see all of, there's this like um, circle that encompasses all of the blue area in the top that, that says fitra, meaning if we strive towards this ruh and towards Allah and towards the akhirah, you know, where we're going, this sort of trajectory forward is coming back into our fitra, our natural state of being in this shaheed, being witnessing. And then the red downward part is only, is only um, dunya deep, right? So at the bottom it says dunya. And that's not to say, that's not to position dunya. And also there's shaitan down there, right? But I made, I specifically made shaitan a different shape than the shape that Allah is in to sit to to sort of visually uh, distinguish that this is not positioning shaitan as the opposite of Allah, mm-hmm. right? That, that is not a reality. Allah is 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 created all this. Allah is above all of this and in all of this and controlling all of this. So right. there is no opposite to Allah. Right. That's one, right? When, yeah, it's the, not Zoroastrianism, right? <laughs> Yeah. So, but in the dunya, that's where you have the duality, only in this temporary realm. And so, mm-hmm. and this is where we're dealing with when we're talking about psychology, because like I said, that exists here in this experience. So that lower part is what we're dealing with in terms of that struggle on this plane. Mm. Yeah, so it, within the human being, you have the ruh, the qalb, the aql, and the nafs. But then we have the broader, more general blue sphere here and we have and the red sphere. So the blue is just the fitra itself, that primordial human nature. Mm-hmm. And then the red, the general is ghafla, which is forgetfulness of that true right. Nature. Right. So it's literally the absence of remembrance of it, right? Right. So we're we're coming to a a, a theme here, which is that the in the same way that darkness isn't anything of it in and of itself it's just absence of light Mm -hmm. right the 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 lower aspects aren't anything in and of themselves except for forgetfulness of the true nature essentially right and uh and it's interesting because i chose to 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 make it ghafla part partly choice but partly came out of the the data and the research that that was talked about a lot because the questions I was asking and the, 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 the picture I was trying to paint was, like I said, from this experience of the human being. And so, you know, clearly, <clears throat> ghafla, meaning forgetfulness of God, <clears throat> is not necessarily also the opposite of fitra, although it is the experience that we have when we're the opposite of us being in our fitra is being in a state of ghafla, of forgetting that, right? Like you said, it's the absence of the light. So this is how, why I think it makes sense there to think of it this way, because it's, 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 how, it's what our experience is, and it's how when people have like presenting problems or they have psychological issues that come up from this model, from this Islamic paradigm, um, 
you know, chemical imbalances and, and realities of, of uh, things notwithstanding, and we can get into what the sort of etymology of that, those are as well, but really that, that though all of these issues or problems or imbalances are coming from us being out of alignment with our fitra. Mm. And so that's going to manifest in um, everything from depression to anxiety uh, to relationship issues where you're, you know, projecting all this stuff onto other people. All these things are, are um, um, uh, s- symptoms of there being an imbalance in, the, in this whole integral system. Yeah, so maybe we can look now. Now is a good time perhaps to, to ask you this question because you mentioned the nafs in kind of distinction to the ruh, the, the, the nafs, which I, I, you know, literally means self. So we could maybe call it the self. But in the sense you were mentioned, the kind of lower self, the forgetful self. But you also have here, actually, uh, on this diagram, three levels of the self. And one is actually in the higher nature, and you have it corresponding to the ruh and in that state of fitra. And then one is the lower one in the state of ghafla. And then there's an intermediate state that is corresponding here to the qalb and the aql. So maybe you could um, go into that. Yeah. <clears throat> so the the nafs, as we talk about it as this lower self, you know, oftentimes it's equated to the ego, but really it's like this um, this part of the self that is pulled downward, right? And so you the the line is connected with the the nafs uh, alamara bilsu, and so. You know, these, these different stages of the soul are mentioned in the Qur'an. And the nafs al is when it's, it's not a, a thing, it's, it's a state that the nafs is in. It's a state that the person is in when they are following their base desires, when they're going with um, everything from egoic impulses to um, any, you know, all the way to like sinful behavior, you know. Mm-hmm. Uh, doing things that are, you know, like killing or, or, or things of this nature that we see as sin, but then also just even as little as being, being in a state of uh, selfishness, of thinking that the, the, all of the good that has happened to you in your life has come from your own action, right? This is a state of being in, in the nafs. And so nafs al is sort of, in this state of not trying to regulate or, or turn the kalb towards the ruh, right? Mm-hmm. It's really just allowing the nafs to take over. And this, um, this can happen in, a, you know, I don't think it, it's not helpful to think of it in this binary of like, oh, well, those people that are just sinning and they're really bad people. Because the reality is, is that we, we cycle through these stages Sometimes in a day, in the same day, or even within the same hour, moments, because our, our the state of our soul is very um, fleeting, and so we're changing all the time. Which is why, you know, this takes a lot of effort to constantly being in this state of dhikr, a state of remembrance, to regulate this self, regulate the system. And so, when the nafs is in a state of just pursuing the egoic impulses, it's in, it's in the state of nafs al basu. And then when the person is making an effort to turn the kalb towards the upper part, upper half of the model, through uh, self-reflection, then they're in a state of nafs al which is the self-reproaching soul. So it's this you, it's the self taking the self into account of saying, okay, well, maybe it's better if I do this or I should try, I should make an effort to stay away from these things because I have learned that it doesn't really lead me towards the right thing or even just because Allah says not to, right? So whatever it is, using this akal to understand that a different path is better. And so that, that state of reigning in is in lawama, which is why the lawama Nafs al is, is in purple because it's in this middle stage of where the work is being done. And so in, in, in psychotherapy or, or even just 
a person's uh, struggle and their jihad and nafs is oftentimes primarily in this nafs al hmm. But then... Yeah, and I nafs- really like this. And I think it's important to just to mention like nafs al bisu literally means the self that commands to evil. So it's sometimes called nafs al just the commanding self or that self which commands to evil. And I think... You know, in your model, this shows really well that, you know, the implication here is that there's, a, there's that in us which commands away from the divine command, which is the command to light, selflessness, truth, generosity, virtue. So there's a part of us that's actually is commanding us to go right. away from the divine command, right? right. So it's, it's that part of us that rises up in opposition in a sense to that and so it's always you know it, like you say it's a state or it's a, it's it's a pull you could even say it's a pull that we all have or even a voice an inclination yeah. right and almost, you know the, i almost think of it as like spiritual gravity it's like the, yeah. the the litter the fact that we're in this physical existence and, and our souls have now been attached to this like um bodily manifestation of our soul that is dense it has this pull towards that almost darkness or separation yeah and yeah i mean you know when we were kids growing up right you have the cartoons where you got the angel on one shoulder and the devil on another and it's really like the nafsa lawama right that reproachful self um even the word reproachful i really like the more like accounting self because it's yeah. it's that which is calling you to account it's it's like it is checking the egoic selfish impulses and it's calling you to towards that which is better and that which is truthful. So, you know, and even in the Quran, uh, Surah Al-Qiyamah, Allah says in the beginning of Surah Al-Qiyamah, I swear by the nafs al and by Yom Al-Qiyamah, which is amazing. So Allah actually pairs Yom Al-Qiyamah, which is the day of accountability, where all right. souls are called into the divine presence, right? The day of standing, literally, where we're all st- standing on the plane in the divine presence and all of our deeds are accounted for. So he pairs that with the nafs al this this accounting self, which is the self that calls you to account. And this is a really profound wisdom, if, you, if we're to reflect upon this, because in essence, one who is... In this greater uh, jihad, as you say, this greater struggle with the self, they are essentially standing for the accounting before they are called to account. They're calling themselves to account before they are called to account. And so it's right. like a mini Yom Okiyama every time you're like checking this impulse. That's right. That's right. It's like doing, doing the work now before you, <laughs> exactly. you know, pay now or pay later. Exactly. <clears throat> And it would be easy, it would be easier, <laughs> I suppose, if it was just us holding ourselves accountable and our, our own pull, like this pull that we have inside of us that you, that you identified. If it was just that, you know, maybe we'd, it wouldn't be as much of a challenge. But then you add to it all of the distractions in the dunya, all of the things that are here to tempt us, all of the things that are here to sort of... Um, Um, further this veil where we can stop with okay this life here is what whatever I see and touch is what's real Mm -hmm. and so we get we get caught up in that and so we have the dunya realm to sort of feed into this nafs alamara and keep us distracted but then we also have shaitan so in the in the model shaitan there is an arrow going pointing into the nuff. So it's actually like there is an influence where shaitan can can use the nuff. It doesn't, the arrow only goes to the nuff. I didn't make it go all the way into the kal because the, the to, to say that shaitan can only whisper to you, right? Uh, shaitan can only come to this sort of uh, external level of your breast, but not actually beneath it into your heart. Mm-hmm. And so these things are, you know, shaitan is a factor in us being pulled away from our fitra and being caught in this cycle of nafs al-amara. And so it's not just us alone 
Um, but there are these other factors that we have to battle, you know, and they're there as sort of uh, tests to to just um, test our authentic, you know, our, our our authentic striving and really um, put it put it in the onus on us to really do the work to to stay in this state of remembrance. Mm. Uh, okay, so we have Nasal Amara, we have Nafsal Lawama, and then there's Nafsal Muthmaina. So maybe you could uh, yeah. comment on that. And, and so when I was interviewing these scholars, almost all of them, some of them mentioned, would only talk about these three just because they were like the main ones that are referenced and the main ones that are referenced in the Quran. But then some people talk about five and some people talk about seven. You know, I think it's, it's, it's common to say that there's seven stages of the soul. Um, the reason why I only put three is because, and this was articulated actually by several of the scholars, in that these three are sort of the, the most important or the most central to understanding this trajectory, and that the others, you know, like uh, Radia Mardia, it's talked about, are like such even higher levels, even beyond, that are like, okay, we're talking about the psychology for the sake of like us learning how to apply this in our daily lives. Right. It's, it's not that common that somebody's going to need a deeper knowledge of these higher states because we're dealing with just sure. even the just trying to get out of the lower ones, right? Or you could even say that the um, those higher levels are um, degrees of mutmaina. They're higher degrees of mutmaina, but they're actually could even be considered a part of it. So if you just right. bless mutmaina, you're essentially you know right. encapsulating those. Right, because it is talked about mutmaina as like the 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 ultimate goal, right? Mm -hmm. um, because it's the soul at rest, yep. and what that means is it's the soul uh, in a state of presence with with their Lord, and so it's at rest because it's submitted. And there's no longer this turmoil of trying to fight off or in this battle um, because the, the Prophet ﷺ talked about the human's heart or the soul as this like boiling pot of water. And there's all of this, um, so the emotions that we experience are like these bubbles coming to the surface. Hmm. But so when the, when the uh, soul is at rest, it's like those bubbles come to 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 rest and it's just at this state of peace because it's just at one with tawheed with with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and so the the idea here and what the scholars talked about and how I sort of um, explain it is that nafs al mutmaina is the goal that we're striving towards so in this paradigm in this model it's not just that we want to go to the top towards our fitra but that the islamic um, uh, paradigm really posits that that there is this upward trajectory, that there is like an actual movement towards coming back, right? And so there is a, it is natural for us to do this, and so we need this other um, this stage of mutmaina as a thing to strive to to keep us oriented towards doing the work and reaching our potential, right? And so. Nafs al mutmaina you may not, most people will not just be stationed there, right? Because that's a pretty high level of, you know, of awliya that are really just living in this place. However, it is something that we need actively in our, in our jihad in order to get tastes so that we know what we're striving for. You know, like, and, and when I say taste, though, like we have to have experiences of being in a state of peace. And so things like doing dhikr, things like ibadah, the things when we're in a state of khushu and prayer, these are momentary um, moments when we cross out of lawama into mutmaina. We may just be at the beginning sort of stage of mutmaina, but we're tasting and experiencing this state of being at peace and being at rest because we have, we are in a state of remembrance essentially, right? And, and we, we are sort of connecting with our fitra which we have the potential to be stationed there. But in order to be stationed there, it takes a, a significant amount of work of cleaning, polishing the heart, and ridding it of these um, diseases of the heart, which we can talk about, which is on the other left side of the model. 
Mashallah, yeah. And, you know, I think, you know, you know, this is, so you could say, yeah, just like you have here, you have the, the jihad and nafs or the greater struggle is the nafs al-lawama versus essentially the nafs al-amara. They're two opposing forces within each one of us, i.e. the conscience, that one, that part of us that is calling us to wisdom, to truth, to the divine presence, to the light. And that part of us, which is calling us to selfishness, to egotism, to darkness. And like you say, this shows up in major things. Uh, like, should I commit this major sin? And it shows up in less, very small things. Like, should I eat the last piece of chocolate cake or should I give it to my spouse? You know what I mean? Like, it, you know, right. so it's just unfolding in everything as far as uh, um, our life. But, you know, it's important to to contextualize it. We mentioned it in the last one, I believe, so people can reference that. But this this uh, jihad and nafs, this greater struggle or the struggle this uh, with the inner struggle is from the hadith of the prophet where he him and his companions were coming back from a battle and he said to them uh, we're now going from the lesser struggle to the greater struggle the lesser jihad to the greater jihad and they said you know essentially saying we just put our lives on the line fighting oppressors and tyrants and we you know some of us were maimed and some of us were killed. What could be greater than that? And he said that battle, which is in each one of us, i.e. that struggle to be uh, filled with light and selflessness, selflessness, etc. And so another amazing hadith of the prophet, which I think um, helps contextualize this for me, at least, is that he said each person has a shaitan within them. So, um, and uh, he said, they said to him, even you, Ya Rasulullah, oh, even you, O oh messenger of God, do you ha also have a shaitan, like a, a, a demonic force, essentially, you could say. And he said, yes, but mine has become Muslim. Right. Mine has submitted, literally, because the definition of a Muslim, etymologically, is one who has submitted. And it's interestingly related here to Mudmaina because it's one at peace. So even, I think, the word Muslim, even though you say, well, it's the religion of one point, however many billion people, but really Muslim as a reality is aspirational because it's saying a Muslim is one who is at peace and fully submitted to the ultimate reality. And most Muslims right. are not there yet. So it's kind of right. aspirational that we are submitted ones. We are Mu'mayna. We are the ones at yeah. peace in the divine presence. And so... Or maybe we get there in a certain part of our day and then fall out of it. And it's like, right, are you Muslim? Right. I, was, I was an hour ago, but I don't know about right now. And I also <laughs> want to say just because, you know, I mean, we're talking about, a, you know, psychology and we're modern people. And some people may be like, oh, shaitan, i.e. Satan. Like, you know, I mean, I think just growing up in Western culture, we think of like this, you know, red person, red kind of ghastly looking creature with horns, right? But the prophet also said that shaitan flows through the veins of the children of Adam like blood. Mm -hmm. So this is important to keep in mind that there's, you know, our tradition doesn't have these visual res representations of some beast, right. right? Which are even symbolic in the Western Christian context. But the, the idea of shaitan is that it's a force that it is within each of us, pulling us away from light, pulling us away from truth, but that eventually even that force can submit, i.e. it can become so weakened mm -hmm. that it no longer has a pull on you, right? That, you know, the voice is like a whisper. It no longer has any sway. It no longer has any ability to cause you to veer from the path. And that is the one who is at peace. Because the the battle essentially is one is one, and the conscience and the the ruh has come to re, come to dominate, and that lower pole is now submitted, as the Prophet peace be upon him said. Right, and these, uh, like you said, this blood, you know, this 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 force running through our veins, is you know you can it, it manifests in many different ways. 
like through ghadab or anger, oftentimes we, when people say their, their, their blood is boiling, right? When they're, when they're angry. And so it's this force that actually runs through. You can see somebody's like veins in their temples start to mm. pop out, right? And so it is these, this reality of this force inside of us, but then our work in this jihad is to put these into check and, and put them into control. And so this is where when you look at the left side of the, of the model, positioned um, diagrammatically in, in relation to these other stages, the, the muhlikat and the munjiat. Mm -hmm. so the muhlikat are down on this red area, and the, the muhlikat in, in, it's translated as like destroyers. Mm -hmm. They're basically these things that are tendencies in us, almost like character traits or vices that get manifested and they get manifested differently in different people and different um, sort of chemistry um, and everything from greed and lust and anger and, you know, uh, ghadab, anger is a big one. Um, and so the, these are realities of our soul. These are realities of our character. But then this whole dynamic of putting them in control, like, like you said, the Prophet ﷺ said his, his shaitan is submitted, is because of all of the, first of all, just because of who he is, the Prophet, mm -hmm. but also all of this cleaning. You know, his heart had been cleaned. And so, and he was always in a state of, uh, remembrance of Allah. And so there is this constant um, um, uh, like training these aspects of our nafs. So the muhlikat are these, these uh, Ghazali talks about them as the diseases of the heart. Mm -hmm. and so there's these traits or these aspects of ourself that really bring us down. But then the, mun, the, the munjiyat are the saviors. Is it what it means? The word, the Arabic word, means saviors, and they are the things that elevate us. And oftentimes, they can be positioned in opposites to the muhlikat, so that they're like the cures for the diseases of the heart. So things like um, wisdom and temperance and justice, right? And so mm -hmm. it's similar to this idea of vices and virtues in the Greek uh, terminology, and a lot of this was 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 used because it's sort of all knowledge is the lost property of the believer right but then from an islamic context it's positioned differently in that um there's other aspects other details added to understanding these different um munjiyat and muhlikat but then that it's positioned in this trajectory of the work that is going on inside of the human soul to elevate and, and um, sort of re realize the true nature. So it's not just that there, we are recognizing these vices, vices as, and virtues as um, that we're trapped in them, but that there's an actual ability for us to transcend them and not to get rid of them because it is part of the nature of our existence in the dunya, but it's submitting all these things and putting them in order, essentially, so that we are in balance and can live, sort of living our fitra self and, and aligning ourselves with our ruh while being occupying these physical bodies that are, have this reality of this downward pull and, this, and shaitan, but it's sort of being able to stay with the witnessing and stay with the remembrance of Allah while you're living in this life, in this body, in this separation. So it's basically, this, it's like a, a beautiful orchestrated play of, of the realization, the active realization of Tawheed within the experience of duality. Beautiful. And then the, so you have the, uh, muhlikat and the munjiat, right? Muhlikat, the 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 destroying vices, you could say, and the munjiat, the saving virtues, and then in the middle you have tahdib al akhlaq. So, what does that mean? So, tahdib al akhlaq is the the means the refinement of character. 
Mm. And so this is why it's in the middle, why it's purple, is because it is a process. You know, these other things, munjiat and muhlikat, are like uh, characteristics, right? And so the tahdib, al akhlaq is the process of putting into balance these different diseases and cures, right? So the, the whole um, and work of, of being self-reflective and understanding and seeing your character traits and then um, putting them into balance by actively trying to um, match the disease with the cure. And we do this by um, essentially aligning ourselves and mimicking the, the behavior and lifestyle of the Prophet mm-hmm. and his righteous predecessors by understanding this, this refinement of character. You know, so much of the Islamic tradition is people are, are talking about akhlaq and manners and behavior, but it's not just socially to, be, to, to sort of look and behave well in the world, like that is an aspect of it, but it is really on the deeper level, it's this purification of the heart. This is what this process is. So all these, these three processes that I have on this model of, of tahdib al-akhlaq, jihad al-nafs, and tazkiyat al-nafs could essentially all be considered the same thing in some aspects mm-hmm. because it's all this work of purification, purifying the heart, yeah. right? Which, which tazkiyat tes- al-nafs really means purification of the self. And so all these things can be included in that. The reason why I put them in different aspects is because tahdib al-akhlaq is, is specific to character you know these dealing with the the uh, management of the munjiat and muhlikat and sort of this process of of uh healing the heart and healing the diseases in the heart and that all can be contained in jihad enough which is struggling against the self but then tezkiyat enough the reason why i put it sort of towards the upper portion is because it really seems like it's talked about a lot by the scholars as this um, sort of extra refinement work on really polishing the heart. So it's not necessarily trying to do this lower work of just getting these big uh, sort of chunks of crust off the heart, but then it's like polishing an already relatively clean heart. Mm. You know, so it's like the work never ends. You can always be elevating and purifying and moving upward on this trajectory. Yeah, I love it. And I mean, you know, just how you've laid it out, there's essentially these parallels and I I like how they relate, but there's different basically columns. You know, the central column is essentially the human being, the parts of the human psychology, you could say, the ruh, the qalb, the aql, and the nafs. And then the, you know, the other column is the the levels of the nafs, mutmaina, lawama, and amara. And then the other column is the uh, akhlaq, like the 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 character essentially, the virtues, right. vices, and then the refinement of character. Um, and so, but it all fits together, um, and it all comes down to the fact essentially that this foundational teaching that we started with, which is that the human being has a true nature, a true self, which is lofty and which is profound. And we have a illusory self, a false nature, a lower self, which is not actually who we are, but that is something we have to transform and we have to work on and we have to battle essentially and i think we mentioned in the last one but it's worth restating because such a simple but profound image from the first nations uh people that this teaching that within each human being there is a wolf of light and a wolf of darkness and they're doing battle and that the wolf that wins is the one that you feed more so this is the method that yeah. whichever one you feed more. And this is a very similar teaching that if you give in to the nafs al it gets stronger. That voice becomes a stronger pull. If you 
characterize yourself, you do the actions, the vices, the destroying vices, right? You're selfish, you're jealous, you're speaking ill of people, you're looking at what they have and you're thinking, I should have that, they don't deserve that. You're, you know, angry or violent or anything of that nature, then it becomes to predominate you more and more. And it, it becomes harder to fight that urge. It becomes who you are, essentially. Whereas if you are generous and if you are kind and if you are courageous and if you have these other, you know, saving virtues, the more you do them, the more they become your natural disposition, right? Until they come to predominate. Um, and I think this is really profound. And I think this, in, a, in essence, if you have this as your paradigm, this will fundamentally change your whole outlook on religion and what it is. Because right. I think, I, I don't know if I mentioned this to you, but years ago I, I did a, an event in, uh, in a Muslim country and a girl came up to me afterwards, after the performance and talk, I did poetry and reflections. And she said, uh, well, that was a nice talk. You talked a lot about spirituality and Islam. She goes, but I have a question. I was a bit confused. Is there spirituality in Islam? <laughs> and I was just like, I literally don't know what even how to answer that. Because like, that's such a crazy question. But the point is, is that, you know, people often ask, well, okay, how do we get nafs and mudmayin? How do we get these saving virtues? And the point is, is that the whole deen itself is only for that. Right. That everything you do, the praying, the fasting, the refraining from the forbidden and the doing the permissible, all of it, the far the obligatory and then the supererogatory acts of devotion every aspect of it is only for this is mm. only for this but i think you know most people haven't been taught this they've just been taught you know this really superficial level of religion which is that like y there's no why right god has a checklist of do's and don'ts and then you get on a list of naughty or nice based on how you do it. And you either get coal in your stocking, you know, in the next word, or you get gifts. It's not on some like, no, the whole, right? It's like Sheikh Abdul Hakim Rad says that, you know, it's theological nonsense to say that the purpose of existence is that, you know, for you to follow some list, that that's right. all that God wants. No, right. that the whole Right in the private piece of wants Adina Nasiha, that the whole way you could translate as religion, but this whole spiritual way is advice, or it is like a map. It is a map of navigating reality. Well, and it's and it's to work on yourself, right? To do this inner work on on changing what is in you. Allah does not change the people until they change what is in themselves. And I think people are so disconnected from what is in themselves that that becomes this really distant um, picture of that they, they just can't fathom. And so then it be, just becomes this uh, very outward relationship to the deen. And so, yes, there is, there is a struggle. There is a jihad in praying, getting up for Fajr, praying, fasting, all these things take effort and surely you're rewarded and you benefit from that effort. Mm -hmm. However, it does not fulfill the whole picture of what really the ultimate goal is changing what is in ourselves. And what that means is what is in ourselves is our heart mm -hmm. and our our being is located and 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 um, here physically in our in our being in our bodies, and we're so cut off from that experience that people's experience of life and themselves, the self, is really from the head up, from the neck up, mm -hmm. and they they have this. We've been so taken by this, um, you know, 
I think therefore I am culture, that people just identify with their intellect and their thoughts. And they really don't have an experience of like what their actual being feels like in their chest. You know, this notion that people talk about the heart and they, you know, and it's either we're talking about the physical heart in terms of medical, this pumping organ, or we're talking about this spiritual philosophical idea of the heart. And there's a missing link there where people need to experience this physical location in their chest being the center of their self. And so this whole idea of the psyche needs to come down from I'm thinking and I, I have these memories and my notion of myself is based on where I grew up and you know their whole self identity is starts from their childhood memories up until the present moment and includes all these hopes and uh, dreams in the future and they're just disconnected from an experiential reality of themselves and therefore an experiential reality of the deen of Islam. And so it becomes this really major disconnect. And then that's when people say, well, if you're telling me that all these things in the deen that I'm supposed to do are, are to bring myself into a place of peace, I'm doing all of them. I wake up for Fajr, I fast Ramadan, I do it, and it's not working, mm. right? And so this is the, the biggest problem, I think, of our, of our time, not even just within the Ummah, but just as human beings, is that we, um, we need to, to link these things together and come down into our bodies and actually learn how to connect with our heart and feel this center of emotion. So when people have, you know, people have anxiety and they have an anxiety attack and they feel their chest caving in and they're out of breath and, and they're swirling with all of these thoughts of fears and worries and concerns. And they're thinking like, well, I just, you know, that's a psychological problem that it needs to be fixed with psychology. And, you know, religion can't help that because religion is about worship. Um, right. And so there's this huge disconnect of like, well, wait a minute. What, it, what, is the, what is the root of your anxiety? Like, well, I'm thinking about all this stuff. Okay. And so then you follow it down. Like they, they're swirling in this place of, of, of trying to be self-directed. Right? I'm, I, wanna, I have this vision for myself and I'm trying to pursue it or I'm worried about all this stuff that I don't have control over and I'm trying to get control over it and it's freaking me out and I'm spiraling out of control and I don't know what to do. And now my chest is caving in because why? They're not breathing. They're not being in the moment and submitting to the fact that Allah is the one that determines their life. And they're trying to determine it. They're trying to take the reins. And when we try to take the reins, a lot of problems ensue in our psychology, in our experience of our of being humans, you know, and, and it, 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 it manifests in all sorts of problems. And so you know, we need to understand that these, um, these prescriptions within the deen are to bring us back into balance, but that they have to be simultaneously done with some inner work, some inner reflection and some, you know, coming into this place of actually changing what is in your heart, not just doing what you think you're supposed to do. It's not a transactional thing. Like if I've done this, I've paid my dues, Therefore, Allah is supposed to bring me out of my problem. You know, it's, 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 it should really be thought of as a transformational rather than transactional, hmm. where we have to do constantly be doing the work internally to, in order to transform, to really reap the benefits of those prescriptions. Well, that's beautiful. And one of our sheikhs, Habib Omar, he said something to the effect of that the whole affair of religion, this whole thing comes down to that all we're trying to do is beautify our, our heart for the gaze of God. Because, you know, the prophet, peace be upon him, said, Allah does not gaze upon your forms. He's not looking at your skin color or this mm -hmm. or that but he's looking at your heart. And that is the seat of your cognition. That is the seat of your intention. That is the, <clears throat> you know, 
and and your all these things and so it's really trying to make yourself beautiful for that divine gaze and that is like such a beautiful way of putting because if you love the divine beloved then you want to beautify yourself for what where they gaze upon you you know what i mean and that's the whole affair is like how can i make myself beautiful for the divine gaze and i mm. and i think you're right when people are simply thinking transactionally you say like i pray all my praise i prayed all my praise for for a month now and i i don't feel anything right <laughs> it's like it's it's not good because that itself is a type of veil because you're 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 doing it like you know, give me something now. Like I did my part. What are you doing for me? And it's, it's, that's bad adept, you know, with your creator. And I, you know, of course we, we always comment on the Hadith Nawafun that, you know, which is an amazing Hadith in the beginning of which we don't always quote, but of all the Hadith and there's hundreds, of, uh, you know, hundreds of thousands of Hadith. There's only one Hadith in which Allah says, I wage war on someone. There's one verse of the Quran and there's one hadith. And the verse of the Quran is I wage that God says I wage war on the people who engage in usury, right? Mm -hmm. Exploitative monetary practices. And the hadith in which Allah says I wage war is uh, I wage war on anyone who harms my awliya, who mm -hmm. harms my awliya, my friends. And then and then it goes on to say that the servant, my servant draws near to me by what I've made obligatory, the obligatory acts of worship, and then continues to draw near by what I, the extra acts of devotion, right? And this isn't just praying and fasting, but this is all these things, those virtues, because those are actually acts of devotion. Being generous is an act of devotion. Smiling at people is an act of devotion, right? In our deen, it's not just you think, oh, I pray a lot and then this happens. No, you actually be a virtuous person in all your dealings, right? Right. And so, you know, continues to draw near by the extra acts of devotion until I love them. And this is the, until I love them. And when I love them, I become the eye with which they see, the ear with which they hear, the hand with which they grasp, the foot with which, with, with which they walk, and in one narration, the, the tongue with which they speak. So here is a really powerful transformative, you know, thing, which also corresponds to your model, right? Because at the, at the top of this whole model is a law, and then the arrow down into the rule. So this is that, right? becoming a, a Rabbani person, a lordly human being, right? Made in the divine image, accessing this human potential. And, you know, that's such a mystical saying, but it also gets at this profound reality of the human being. Yeah, and it's this, it's this process of uh, uncovering. Mm. You know, and that work of uncovering, like you said, being a virtuous person, showing virtues, it's not, a, it's not an easy thing if you've ever tried it. In order to actually do that, you can't just like see how a virtuous person acts and then repeat the words that they say. Mm. That's, not, that's not being virtuous, right? And so in order to do that, in order to get from A to, to, to B, you've got to do some serious self-reflection and then work cleaning removing the blockages that are getting in the way of you actually being able to want what's good for your brother or sister you know when really we have we have the reality is we have these impulses and oftentimes we don't put ourselves in check you know we have these thoughts that come fleeting that are you know not our best self and instead of like owning up to it and facing ourselves and sort of facing the uglier part of ourselves we sort of push it aside and then paste over these virtues. And it's basically like spiritual bypassing. You know, we're, we're, we're mimicking and acting as how we think we're supposed to do by doing the behaviors, but we haven't actually done the work of uncovering what is covering our hearts to be able to genuinely be virtuous. And so that 
it's because it's scary. It's scary to face ourselves. It's scary to own up to the fact that we're, we have these sort of um, ug uglier aspects of our character. And then, you know, to, to actually take the time of not just staying with like running in the rat race and doing life in the dunya, but actually taking the time to look inward and to sort of refine your character and understand what, what work do you need to do to, to transform your heart so that you can actually shine this beauty that Allah has given you and reflect Allah's light. You know, that, that, that's the work that we're here to do. And it's, and it's very much a religious uh, trajectory. It's very much what religion positions us to do. And it's very much what psychology is all about. It's all about uh, healing and, and, and removing the problematic symptoms that are getting in the way of us functioning in, at our best. You know, and, and, and in an Islamic paradigm, our best is much higher than what we have positioned our best to be in a sort of a secular Western version of psychology, which is just sort of, you know, getting along with people and, and having a happy life and sort of plugging into the system. Like we, we have this, we, Islam posits that we, we can actually transform into these, um, like you said, like Rabbani, like godly beings. Mm -hmm. And so this, this is not necessarily to put it on this pedestal of like, well, this is such a high aspiration, but this is why we're given the Prophet as our model and to try to be like him, not to expect that we're going to be like him because we won't. But the, the work is to actually strive to better ourselves in every single moment and understanding that there is no, there is no limit to that. Yeah, and this puts a, such a more profound uh, understanding on the whole concept of the sunnah the whole concept of following the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, that he is the exemplar who, I, you know, essentially he represents the best, the, the potential within each one of us, right? That there's a kind of like a Muhammadan nature, which is that self at peace, which is that spiritual nature in constant contemplation of the divine, which is that being free of that lower egoic satanic pull, which is the being free of these destroying vices. Um, purely selfless, purely generous, purely virtuous. And, you know, the more that we follow him outwardly and inwardly is the more that we, you know, really become our true selves. Yeah. Because he's really the model of personality, you know, the personality model from Islamic paradigm is he, he is what we're striving for. And he is what we um, theoretically have the potential to, to, to move toward. Mashallah. Yeah, I mean, I really like this. And, and I did want to mention too, you know, just having kind of been exposed and just to kind of observe um, the field of kind of Islamic psychology, or you could just say Muslims in the field of psychology, you know, you see this real kind of dichotomy between those who, you know, it seems like a lot of Muslims in the field of psychology, they are Muslims and they're interested in uh, serving Muslim populations, but they're not actually working from a traditional Islamic framework of the soul, i.e. Islamic psychology. It's really a Western secular model that they're then putting islamic terms on right. and you know you could probably speak to this more than me as kind of an outsider of the field but you know this is why one reason i feel like what you're doing is so important because you're saying like it's really good to you know take the insights of modern psychology it's really good to serve muslim populations but we're doing everyone a disservice if we're not you know, the, if we are accepting a framework for the human being that is actually counter to the Islamic tradition. Yeah. Yeah. And I think, I think, it w unfortunately, a lot of people miss, and I think mo 
most, if not all, people who are in the field and trying to do this work have the best of intentions and are trying to help the the ummah. And they're, they're even people who are like genuinely and in a lot of cases doing a good job at integrating the knowledge that they have about Islam and, and using it to make it make sense to people and to help people. And I think the only thing is just that we haven't yet, are, you know, we hadn't yet up until this point really understood and articulated and disseminated this information all in one place so that we can understand what it means to come from an Islamic paradigm. And I think because the only training out there in psychology that you can really get up until now was, was this Western psychology, and because non-Muslims and Muslims alike have sort of bought into that psychology as a science, and so they've just sort of, oh, well, psychology is psychology. What do you mean Islamic psychology? That's ridiculous. Why would you need to do that? Because it's, it's a thing in and of itself, and it's a reality, and we study it. And I think people don't realize that psychology is based on epistemology. It's based on how you perceive what the human being is. And so I think without that depth of knowledge, and people just miss, they just miss the reality and, and what they're training themselves to do a lot of it not to say i would say a lot of it is really useful really helpful and not problematic but then what happens is because it's built on this foundation of things that are rooted in individuation individualism even hmm. rooted in this thing of like that that health is defined by somebody uh pursuing what they want you know pursuing what their what they have de de determined is the treatment goal Meaning like, I know I want to get to where I'm happy or where I have X, Y, and Z situated in my life. And then, you know, the, the process of therapy might be helping somebody follow their own personal trajectory and self-direction, which is dangerous from an Islamic perspective. And so there's a lot of these things that if you don't understand it from a fundamental aspect, what happens, it's like a Trojan horse. These people who, who have the best of intentions and think that they're following along with an Islamic principles because they're bringing those principles in aren't realizing that some of these models of psychology or even just ways that, of traditional working can actually um, like uh, render all of that work um, in, in sort of I guess, taking it out of alignment with the Islamic paradigm, you know? And so, uh, inshallah, I hope that the, the work that I'm doing can just at least be a conversation starter or a, you know, sort of throwing something into the, into the ring to get the ball rolling in terms of building a foundation from the ground up. So like my, my mentor, Professor Malik Badri, uh, like 40 years ago wrote this, book and talked about how people sort of paint, you know, like if, if we take Western psychology as like this building that's um, decrepit and falling apart, and then we want to make it better and make it more Islamic, and so we paint this Islamic paint over it, and then think that it's going to be good enough. But really, the work that he was saying needs to be done is to build a, a, a building from the ground up so that the foundation is built on the ontology and epistemology and sort of cosmology of Islam to then um, orient ourselves to understanding human beings and psychology from a place that is really rooted in our tradition. Um, and so I think, alhamdulillah, uh, this is the work that now I think people are really realizing is needed and really getting on board with. So I think there's a lot of uh, developments that are going to be happening uh, in the near future to, to, to really so that people can start being trained in this and start to implement it and it can become something that the Muslim Ummah benefits from. But then also, I, I believe, once it's established and people are practicing it and Muslims can, can teach other people and say, look, this is what we have, this is what we've learned from our tradition, then it can be you know, offered to the rest of the world to benefit from, like I mentioned in the last podcast, whether or not they're Muslim, just like Buddhism does. You know, I was the other day I was in a bookstore and I was looking, just out of curiosity, looking in like the self-help section, which is huge, by the way. It's like half the bookstore. <laughs> 
and I look at like the back of all of these books, like the front will just talk about self-help and mindfulness or whatever it is that's trendy. And then all of them, almost all of them reference Buddhism. It's like da -da 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 -da, coming from, you know, B Buddhist teachings. And so I, I just think that there is a, a whole we wealth of knowledge to be pulled from, from the Islamic tradition that can offer just, just our understanding of human psychology. Hmm. Yeah, absolutely. <clears throat> Mashallah. Well, you've been really generous with your time, but uh, in closing, um, so we're going to share this model um, and link to it, but uh, why don't you also let people know where they can find this model and, and the paper that the model is in. Um, I believe we mentioned it in the previous podcast, but let's yeah. mention it again. Uh, so the paper is called Toward a Framework for Islamic Psychology and Psychotherapy, colon, an Islamic Model of the Soul. Uh, so it's kind of a long thing, but I, basically if you wanted to just, uh, you could just Google Toward a Framework for Islamic Psychology, it will come up. Um, or you could Google my name, Abdullah Rothman, I think it will come up. Um, but it's published through the Journal of Religion and Health, published by Springer. Um, and then I also have a, I have a, a page on a academia, um, and there's there's plenty of ways to find it. So, but inshallah, you can put a link, people can read it, and it's free. It's free to access. It's open access, so anyone can download it. Yeah, I highly recommend for everyone to uh, check that out, and we'll put links inshallah as well. Uh, yeah, man. So, what else do you have? Uh, that you're working on coming up that you're excited about? Well, I, this, so this whole model was only like a portion of my research. It was like the foundational part of it. But then I did a, a second study of 18 clinicians who incorporate uh, Islamic principles into their practice and basically looking at now what does this model look like in practice? So actually developing um, an Islamic model of psychotherapy so this is like what we've been talking about is Islamic psychology, you know, understanding sort of the, the um, anatomy of the soul. And then the other half is in application. And so ironically, out of these 18 people, sort of like what we were talking about, you know, a lot of people want to be doing this. And I selected people who you know, are doing, would self-identify as doing some version of Islamically integrated psychotherapy. And even through the process of interviewing them and showing them the model and talking about it, a lot, of, a lot of them discovered like, oh, wow, this is a lot deeper than I had even realized. Hmm. You know, and so <clears throat> the next portion of that is really mapping out and hashing out what it looks like in, um, in, in something like psychotherapy in terms of approaches to how to implement this foundational theoretical knowledge into working through just you know problems that people have in their daily life and and so i'm publishing a paper inshallah in the next few months that that reports those results and it has some other diagrams and models that sort of position what the islamic model brings in terms of this deeper aspect involving the qalb and the ruh uh, as as uh, integral aspects of human psychology Mashallah, excellent stuff, man. I know you're traveling a lot and you're speaking about this more and more and there's a lot of interest. Um, and inshallah, this podcast will also connect with a lot of people. And <clears throat> I know we've spoken about doing a, a course on Rumi Center covering some of these topics. So inshallah, we can make that yeah. happen. People I would be good. It. I'd be happy to. All right, bro. Allah bless you and uh, bless your work, man. It's really important work. And you know, you know, there's so there's so much there in really translating this beautiful 1400 year old tradition you know that the prophet peace be upon him said every hundred years there will be a reviver mujtahid and which is really amazing about that is that a revival means that the the, the texts themselves the tradition itself won't be lost but it implies that it will need to be rearticulated for the psychology of the people of the time. That, right. that, that because people change and eras change, that there will be need to be rearticulations re for the psychology of the time. And I think you're really 
this is that work because this is really speaking to the people of our age and uh you know yeah it's that's ironic because in, in academia people are always talking about especially in research like producing new knowledge <laughs> new knowledge you know, like what is that you know my in doing my phd is like well what is the new knowledge that you're bringing to the field and i'm like you know this is old old knowledge you know it's just it's just bringing it in a different light so people can rediscover it like you said it's the yeah and then ironically a lot of the the, where we're drawing the most from in, in Islamic psychology is 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 Ghazali's Ihya al mm -hmm. You know, so it's like like you said, he was a reviver, and we are sort of communally, collectively reviving it and updating it to make sense to the to the people of these modern times, which is like you said, it's essential and it's it's expected. It's part of what it's how Islam stays relevant and keeps it fresh, keeps it alive, and ultimately that's the the reality. Is not this. It's not this uh, stagnant thing or this religion that's so like like some giant in the hills that we're scared of and is is we don't understand. It, it needs to be a living, thriving, breathing reality. And so, this is the work, and I think it makes sense in these in this terminology of psychology for modern day people. So, inshallah, inshallah, with uh, with your blessings and everybody's dua and all of our hard work, inshallah, this will benefit a lot of people. I mean, I mean. Jazakallah khair. Allah bless you, bro.